And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the head of d Games. Not, not to be confused with a G-Clef, that's a whole other instrument. Eh. And the creator of the upcoming post-apocalyptic game, Residium. The one, the one and only Ralph D. Silviestro. I'm hoping I got that pronunciation right. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm great, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I meant I managed to get I managed to get inside for my walk before before the uh, little rainstorm that happened earlier today got worse. Um, but it's just it's just a lab, it's just a Labor Day where um, even if I want even even if I wanted to do some grilling, it's kind of hard to do that when it when it's raining out. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Um, you can certainly do it, but the magic's not there. Um, so, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it um, stick? Well, I started playing them when I was pretty young, probably uh, fourth or fifth grade. We did like old second edition, D&D second edition campaigns run by, you know, 11-year-olds. So it was just cheating and fake rules, and, you know, we basically just did what we wanted to. Mm. And then I probably got out of the RPG the tabletop RPG thing, and then into more of the digital thing. So I did World of Warcraft and other games like that and got back into RPGing as an adult probably about seven or eight years ago where we just literally dusted off all of our two e-books and then started up campaigns with the same group of people that we did, you know, we were like 10 years old. Um, and that was really, really interesting coming back to it as an adult and then playing all those, all those. we had even played some of the old characters we had rolled when we were 11 years old. So it's pretty hilarious. Mm-hmm. Now, when it com- now when it comes to when it com- now you you had started with you had mentioned starting out with um with D with D and D two E um were there when either at that time or when you came back were there any other RPGs that you had that you can remember dipping into for a significant amount of time? Uh, no tabletop RPGs, but mm-hmm. um. Definitely the, the digital ones. Like I played uh, Elder Scrolls, and obviously I mentioned World of Warcraft. That was like, you know, like eight years of my life. I don't even want to tell you the time, the slash T, when you're trying to figure out how much time you played over that eight years. It's a you know pretty embarrassing amount of time going for like the Grand Marshal title and all those crazy grinds. Um, and then just just the big, you know, the big ticket, you know, big studio RPGs that would come out was probably the only ones I I really looked at. I, I'm I'm playing Red Dead Redemption currently. I loved that series. Um, I never played like the um, or like the Final Fantasies. It's just something I, did. I I don't think I was as much into the RPG universe as a whole um, as I was other things. All right, I got gotcha. you. So, with uh, the main re- the main reason that I asked is um, with Residium, you're doing a um, post apocalyptic um, game. And something I was curious mm-hmm. about is is if that was a if that was a genre that you um that you had a lot of had a, a fair amount of background in at some at some um leading up to its de- leading up to its development. Yeah, so I mean, I played games like Fallout and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, not religiously, but um, I definitely have dabbled in. And you know, you all see the you know the Mad Max, and there's a whole bunch of post apocalyptic um, things that you can draw from, which I found I found to be um, I wanted the game, I'm going to say derivative, but because but that's kind of a bad word if you say you want your product to be derivative. But like, I think derivative things can be really fun because you're pulling from something that's in your own memory, something that's that you're feeling personally, right? So when I'm thinking of these games, I'm thinking of, um, I, I derive my characters and I derive the look and the feel of the world from things like X-Men or District 9 or like maybe even like the fifth element or like some stuff that may not be like 
in and of itself totally post-apocalyptic, but has a very cinematic feel. And then definitely you can draw from the post-apocalyptic things if you wish. But no, I wasn't really thinking about uh, game specific post-apocalyptic games that I played or otherwise. Yeah, I can I can definitely um, go with that. Now, what what was the spark that inspired that inspired the creation of Residium? Yeah, so um, Residuum, when we when I started it, it, it started out as a D and D two E mod. Basically, we were, you know, my friend was GMing or DMing that, and then I was like, hey, I'll do a few sessions. Let me make up a little um, a thing based on the two E rules. So I made some character classes and, you know, just put up a little setting in. And we just kind of like played it with two E rules. Mm -hmm. But then we very quickly realized like, yeah, this was fun, but like the rules can't really account for, you know, some of the maybe crunchiness that you're looking for in the, with modern weaponry or the different powers that we were using and stuff like that. So eventually we slowly stripped away the two E and didn't eventually basically started from scratch and then kind of, uh, built it up from, okay, well, how are we going to roll attack rolls? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really the origin of it. And that was about seven or eight years ago. Uh, and then over the next like two or three years, we it was just in flux, right? Just doing like fun things. And then eventually I was like, this is becoming a game. I think this is actually really interesting and it has some legs to it. So I decided just to go for it and fully flesh it out and get some artwork done and do the whole thing. All right. So, so it's a so in this case it's an instance of a um a effectively a two, effectively a two e hack that just um be, became a monster unto itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, we, we're the group of people that I play with is really good at breaking rules and exploiting systems and everything, which probably informs some of the things that I'm doing in my rules. Um, so which was it was great for me because they can easily be like, nope, this is bad. I can break it like this. So I can go ahead and then fix it. So with the two E rules, there was too many questions, uh, too many ways for them to sort of, uh, I don't know, <laughs> just <laughs> break everything I created. So we had to kind of make a thing that wasn't doing that. Yeah. Now I can definitely see some of the, um, some of the, um, AD and D second, um, influence within certain parts of, the uh, can't, with certain parts of the rules, mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the big ones, of course, being how there's a bit there's a bit of a chart with the when it comes to the bonuses that each of the ability scores has. Although one thing I did notice yep. is that you didn't limit yourself to just the core six ability scores, as pe as people understand them. Right, yeah, like there the what is it strength agility. Uh, fortitude, per personality, mm -hmm. acumen, and I'm, I'm going to say a D and D one if I don't think too hard about playing um, too many different campaigns. According according to, but yeah, list, that that was a thing. Yep. And another another in, another instance when it when it comes to this is um, and that that was actually that was actually curious about is. The is the use of uh, classes within within it, since you've got a set of classes that are um, rooted in the three types of um, races: um, humans, right. humans, and um, Bilanti. And right. Yeah. So yeah. Go ahead. What I was curious about was what what were um, how did that particular approach come about? So one of the things that I really liked. Um, when I'm creating stuff on my own, regardless of this game, I like to have things be as simple as possible, but still get a little bit of um, personalization. Like there's a, there's an elegance that I'm I like to go for when I'm trying to make a thing. So um, I wanted to have the ability for people to multi-class as much as they wanted to. But every game I've played, the multi-classing systems are like, oh, by the way, and if you want a multi-class, here's this like kind of convoluted way to convoluted way to do it, and then you know it makes me just not want to participate in it like to think that extra hard to make some perfect class so i wanted you to be able to like literally just combine whatever you want so there are 11 human classes nine mutant mutations and four bloody disciplines and within each of those races you can customizing and and multi-class your if you will multi-class your class with any other class effectively making a completely unique 
class that no one's ever played before with the amount of powers there are in the game um there i mean it's like thousands of combinations really so um i think that's where i was i wanted to just be like if you want this pick this and you, you don't you don't get anything for free everything that you get when you level up you choose and then therefore you know your your character is exactly what you want and unique and um relevant for the party but that you might also in the same token have um like stuff that's going to hinder your party as well so you're not you're just going to be a super awesome whatever at everything but um you'll have positives and negatives no matter how you do it at least that's the intent yeah um of course the uh, the main thing that I, that I see with the approach that you have is for um is with this tr is with the uh, tree setup and when it comes to multi-classing at the very least when it comes to D and D, I i can say that um it's always going to, no matter what they do, it's always going to be awkward in that case, simply because that was a game that was never designed for it. Right. Oh. It certainly seems that way, right? <laughs> no, when it, no, when it comes to, when it, like, there's, there's certainly, there's certainly been no shortage of attempts, but, um, you either, you either have instances where you have a like, really convoluted case of it. Or you have instances where you have to do way too much pre-planning. I'm guessing that was the other thing you wanted to avoid. Yeah, like, if you want to, I mean, so if you're going to say, like, if the game exists on a continuum somewhere between, like, very crunchy, number crunchy, and very narrative-y, I really wanted to try and strike a balance between the two. So I wanted the ability to multi-class and not think about it. You can just do whatever you want and then... It should be totally fine. But if you really want to, it, look for synergies in between classes and like, oh, if I get just this one power in this other tree, all of a sudden I've got these multipliers or what, so whatever that's going to make my guy really incredible. So that's there for you if you want it. But if you don't want to do that and don't want to play that way, then like you don't have to. It's not going to ruin the game. So I think that was my intention behind making it um, the way that I did. Mm -hmm. And... Like I d and that's def and of course um when it come now when it comes to the whole when it comes to the uh, three races with humans, mutants and um Bil and Bilanti, was was there ever was there ever an attempt early on to do the kind of race as class that would that um was seen in early versions of D and D with that. Sorry, sorry about that. What I was saying is that um, what in in some of the earlier ver in some of the earlier versions of of the uh, system, what was the um, when it came to the three races was was it originally des was it designed at any point as a kind of race as class approach like you might see in early D anD D. Okay, now I think it's back. Yeah, sounds good so, now. That sorry was, about that. Just cut um, right out. Yeah. Um like I, I I look at the um the way that the way that it's set up and I could I couldn't help but wonder if this is one of those things where in some of the early notes it um there was a bit of a race as class thing going on. Was that the was that the case in some in some of the early drafts of the game? What do you mean exactly? Um, where the where um race and 
in in certain versions of D and D, especially in the early days, there were instances where um your race and your class were one and the same. And I'm wondering if for if for instance, when it came to like the Balanti, if that was ever a case, or the or the whole power types thing was something that you had built in um, from the get go. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. So the original iteration was there was there was very very little choice. Like I basically rolled out a you know whatever like a, a weapons master, and every level a new power would unlock. Mm -hmm. basically and you may i forgot if i even gave you choices at all i may not have given any choices at all to be honest and then it was just things unlock and this is just your class and then if you wanted to go into another class you would then just start at the beginning um so in that regard there was no there was no choice but the races still had um their own classes within them like there was still like the class structure within the race because I only had the three races that I was dealing with, so I, that would be far too few, I think, classes to just have. But, um, but I think I started with ten total, and now there's what for eleven plus nine plus four is twenty-four. I'll be hit twenty-four total. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, I think that's that's the difference there. There definitely was not the choice in the cross um, cross picking synergy between any of those classes like that. Nothing like that existed. Yeah. Um now, when it comes now, when it comes to the when it com when it comes to the uh, different because because uh, I look at human, mutant, and Belanti in, in this regard as um, three kind of gameplay pillars. Um, mm -hmm. What sort what sort of play styles would you say that human that classes, mutations, and um, disciplines would um, favor? That's a good question. Um, so humans are the far more gear dependent uh type there's the far more gear dependent race right they they start out with armor most of them do they are looking for ammunition they need weapons to be successful um there's in a way we ironically if, if you're going to compare them to a D, D class the humans are in a way a little bit more like wizards because you can think of their like ammo usage and and their uh supply management as like spell slots right if you were not ammo you're screwed. You you're, you can like run up and punch someone in the face if you can do that. That's great, but um, you have to sort of conserve a lot of your resources like you would a, a wizard, right? But if you're a mutant, a lot of the mutant abilities we do have some that are like battle powers or recovery powers that are only usable once per day, or you know the typical things that you would expect. Um, but a lot of them are just like I can use this power. I can throw a fireball at your face. I can try and control your mind. I can teleport from here to there. Like those are just things you can do freely. So the mutants are a little bit more, um, they're more like a class, I guess like a warrior class where you're just like, I just attack. Obviously you've got far more choice with the mutants, but you don't have to worry about conserving your resources nearly as much as you would a human. And it's the same with Bilotti. They're, they're designed, not a hybrid between humans and mutants, but the idea was that the mutant powers are derived from something in the Bilotti's physiology to begin with. Uh, because of the virus and all that stuff in the story of the game. Mm -hmm. So there are some similarities between how some of the mutant powers manifest themselves to from the Bilotti powers. Um, but the Bilottis also start with um, these weapons. They're called dead rifles. It's uh, directed energy discharge. Uh, and it's there's something that they use to channel their power through. So they actually start with maybe like, I guess it would be considered a pistol that they can use to shoot like a power attack at an enemy like a human would, but obviously with no ammunition. Mm -hmm. So you get a little bit of the best of both worlds with the Bilotti. Um but I, I think that's a uh, that's how they kind of work. Yeah, but um, what I'm what I'm seeing out of it is that he, is that there is I wouldn't say that there's any any particular build that it, that could that could be the equivalent of the simple fighter. Um, in ter in terms of right in terms of just be just being that just being that kind of one trick pony. Right, because even the ones that I designed to be a fighter, like the Brawler or the Goliath, so the mm -hmm. Brawler would be the human class and the Goliath would be the mutant one, you still have, like the Brawler's got these powers that they can use. Like they go below a certain amount of health and they can get health back or they can um, uh, do more damage or they can sacrifice their bonus attack dice for more, all, all this like extra things. So it still feels like, you know, I'll say wizardy again, but it's probably not the right word, but it feels like you're making a choice and your, your play style can be unique. 
because all brawlers are not going to be the same. You get to choose your tree and multi-class with whoever else. So it definitely gives it a, um, there's a lot of choice in the game if you wish to have it. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now, um, when it comes, when it comes, the other thing that I'd noticed when it comes to the, um, when it comes to the classes is the, is the fact that, um, there is the, there is definitely that tree with um with six with six tiers of it, but I didn't see a whole right. but I it I didn't see a whole lot in the way of very specific um restrictions when it comes when it comes to when it comes to acquiring po acquiring powers or or acquiring skills, um, mm -hmm. which is which for me I for for me personally I find that refreshing because. As I as I think I made clear um, previously, I don't care for the notion of of having of having people pre plan what their character is going to be way down the line. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the way so originally, I think I had a few more restrictions, and then I've since stripped them away. Um, the only restriction that you have is at the start of the game when you pick your first class, mm -hmm. you have to have your whatever pro primary characteristics uh, or ability scores have to be of a certain like number right but it doesn't matter any of your secondary or tertiary classes that you choose your number your all your numbers could be far below those numbers so if you want to pick a brawler who's a obviously someone who uses a lot of strength and you got nine strength you're welcome to do so it might really suck but maybe you can find a really creative way to make it work with mm -hmm. the different weapons that you're using um and then aside from that the powers themselves have a couple of them have prerequisite requirements if it was something that i feel like really needed it like you're not going to be able to hurl an object with your mind if you don't have telekinesis so you got to have the telekinesis and then you can do this other thing right so um but for the most part there are it, it, there's not a lot of restrictions i didn't it didn't <laughs> didn't keep with the um idea that i wanted people to be able to do whatever they wanted to so i just took all those away <laughs> yeah now when it now, um, when it comes to when it, when it comes to combat, um, one of the things I know, one of the things that I did that I did um, make make note of is the, is the fact that you you went with a you went you went with a um, d six when it came to when it came to attack when it came to attacking where for, where a four or higher is a um, success instead of go was when it came and this is one of those things where again I'm go I'm get I'm getting going with the whole um how it was in the early days versus how it's developed into now in some of those sure. early um drafts were did the game still use a more traditional approach to attacking an armor class yeah so the very the very first modular on the 2e campaign we literally had like thaco and we had d20 rolls for attacking right mm -hmm. so like we had it was and then but then it was just like well how do you vary what type of attack you're doing with that right but yeah for sure the first iteration was d20 i liked rolling d20s i didn't want to leave the system because it's just comfortable but it just didn't make sense in the end and d6s felt a little it felt very table gamey which i kind of like the idea that um if you want to run, run a campaign and you know, roll a lot of dice, you can absolutely do it with this game, or you can ignore it and play narratively if you want to as well. But, you know, up to, in your attacks, if you can do up to six attacks or six shots or strikes, depending on your character or class, mm -hmm. you can roll up to 10 die uh, potentially because if you have bonus attack dice. So rolling 10 D6s is just as, it's just fun, <laughs> right? And D6s, I think, are like some of the funnest dice to roll. I mean, they're not the coolest one for sure because they're very common, but just rolling them makes it feel like a, uh, I don't know, more like a casino game or something. Yep. Um, and to 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 that to that particular end, especially given the fact that unless unless like like the core default is is of course anything above four is your um is your lucky number. But when you mention mm -hmm. when you mention die like that, the vibe that I end up getting and maybe and maybe I'm wrong on this is that you don't have to use all of those strikes at all of those strikes at once. You don't have to dump it all at at a specific target if you so choose. Exactly. 
Yeah. So the, and this goes further to the a point of choice that I was making before. So you can do a lot of damage if you make six, like, let's say you're a weapons master and you're shooting an assault rifle. Mm -hmm. You can do uh, six shots. Okay. Uh, you can roll you, each die that you roll represents one shot plus your bonus attack dice. So you roll six shots, that's six dice. Um, but you're, you're more likely to get a, 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 a critical strike if you're rolling less, right? So the way that the criticals work in the game is uh, if all of six, all sixes are rolled on your declared shots or strikes, then it's a critical and then you roll extra damage for that. Mm -hmm. So if you only roll one die, but then you're rolling four bonus attack dice, the likely of you getting a critical because one six out of those five rolls is pretty likely, right? So then you, you can get the bonus from critical, which is a far more efficient use of your ammo. Maybe you're not going to do quite as much damage as if you just spray a target with, you know, six shots, but um, you definitely would be doing more efficient damage. And some classes are designed actually to benefit more from taking a single shot, like the gunslinger, for example. They're, they do wheel pistols, and if you're just firing off rounds after round after round, you're not going to partake in the efficiencies that that character class can provide you. Mm -hmm. And actually you can do less damage over time by wasting more ammo. Yeah. And the other, th the other thing to note when it comes, when it comes to that, and I'm, pr I'm pretty sure this was one of the things that ended up happening when you drifted away from Thaco is the fact that defense mm -hmm. is um, damage is purely damage. Soak. Right. Uh, instead, uh, but instead, only for certain types of damage. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, obviously, but it le but it leans more in that it leans more in that instead of reducing your chip instead of um reducing the odds that uh, instead of reduce instead of messing with the odds that you're actually going to get hit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big point. I, I we had some uh, arguments about whether to go with that system or not um, because I. I wasn't necessarily a big fan of Soak because I didn't like the idea that, I don't know, it just felt a little cumbersome. Um, but then if you want to build like like a true tank, you can really just stack that defense up. But the, the cool thing about it is, again, if you're fighting against a mutant or someone who doesn't have, um, whose powers go right through your defense, then like you can be a tank that's all tanked out, but it feels very deadly, right? So the game from level one feels extremely deadly because not only can you be doing a ton of damage at the beginning with by rolling all these shots or strikes, but your enemies can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when it when it comes to the when it comes now when it comes to the um, when it when it comes to how the flow of combat is get, is is going to is going to end up working. Um, would you say would you say it's a case where ev where um you're get where players are going to be encouraged to use every little advantage that they can find because they because they can't yeah, so, take as much yeah go ahead. I, yeah like it, I think it depends on the, the group style right if your group didn't um isn't thinking about I got a healer class I got a support class I got a tanking class if they're just more just flying by the seat of, the, seat of their pants then they may need to be a little bit more creative with how they solve their problems because um you know if you're just going to be reckless and run around and not like there's a cover mechanic in the game which provides a lot of um chances for your opponents to miss right you can if you're in heavy cover your opponent needs to roll a six instead of a four to hit you which can for sure save your life many times um so yeah if you're not using these tactical advantages that for either provided by the mechanics or provided by your own character classes, then it's a deadly enough game where if your GM wants to, they could just like level you, you know? Mm -hmm. And when it, when it comes to, um, when it comes, when it comes to the cons, when it comes to the concept of um, ethics within this, was that was that your attempt to do your own spin on the uh, on the alignment system without having the um, problems that the alignment system can have? Exactly, we dumped the alignment system in our two E campaign pretty early on because it just didn't. There were always questions like, you know, why how it worked, and you know, there's always arguments about it. And I thought this was just a little bit more. Um, I guess cut and dry the way we have it, and then, but still providing you with a decent amount of choice, 
you know, you have like, if you're going to say your true neutral character, well, that would be our indifferent character, right? Maybe a mercenary who would just do something bad or do something good as long as it benefits them. I don't know. Self-serving, virtuous. These They'll track relatively um, closely with some of the more obvious um, ones in the D&D system. But we just wanted something a little bit more clear and also, you know, you know who really cares if you if you if if you want to play your uh, ethics really 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 well, then your GM could reward you for that. And if you're not really a player that likes to do that, then that's fine too. But it's up to the players and the GM to decide how they want to have those ethics play into their um, game styles. Mm -hmm. And when it com when it comes to um... When it came, now, when it came to when it came to weapons and the, and um their their proficiencies, um, did you was it one of those things where you want where you want to have it where um you have to start you have to start small and build your way up? Um, to an extent, but also, well, f firstly, anybody can accept something that requires like a mutant power that you don't have. Anybody can pick up any weapon and use it. Mm -hmm. They might be like terrible at it, but they can try. So again, I didn't want to tell people, no, you can't do that. Um, but in the second part of what you said, some characters start out with some pretty um, like heavy duty damage. Like the weapons master I mentioned before, right at level one, he's going to be doing a pretty decent amount of damage. He's probably one of the highest damage level one classes. But then as the game goes on, he only gets a little better where other people get made a lot better. Um, so he, you know, at level one, if you're going to throw just a regular level one mob, he can like waste that mob no problem if he wants to use all of his ammunition. Like it's up to him. Um, but again, that goes to the deadliness of the game, right? If you want to, how much, how many bullets do I waste? Oh my God, this guy's really bad, really, really strong. Do I want to just do 40 damage to him right now? But even though they don't know he has 15 health or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the character balance, the class balance is not something that I really am trying to make. Uh, I don't like balance, really. I like characters that are like, this is what I do. I'm great at this and I'm bad at this. And other people are like, well, I'm the damage guy. This is my job. So you might have a character that just doesn't do as much damage and they shouldn't feel like, well, this is unbalanced. Why would I ever play this class? This is stupid. Well, you have your own things that you can do. And to me, that's far more interesting. And it was the thing that kind of bothered me about D&D as well, where a lot of the classes, they sort of felt the same, especially at higher levels. And even like the way the check system works, like everybody was just great at everything or at least relatively equal. And I just thought that was a little, you know, I guess kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Now, so I'm just looking for uniqueness. When it, now, um, would you, would you say that, um, would you say that the game, um, leans a little bit on the lethal end of things or let, or a little less so? Uh, I definitely think it leans on the lethal edge of things. Uh, you can obviously design it however you like, throwing like less uh, mobs at your guys, but um, it's for sure, even at level one, um, that's probably where the balance is most exaggerated, where like if you're not carefully designing it and carefully understanding what your players can do, you could easily just wipe your, your party out and end your campaign in the, fir <laughs> in the first session if you aren't careful. Um, but just the nature of the system, the the minimum to maximum damage you can do as you level up because there's some multipliers in there, which I have to be really careful that I didn't add too many, you know, the highest damage characters around level, uh, let's say six to 10 could be doing like in one turn, 60, 80, a hundred or more damage potentially if they're rolling exactly the right things. Whereas a regular average character might only be doing like 25 damage, 30 damage. Right. So, that widespread could also be the same for your enemies as well. And th the reason why I chose to make it like that was because if you get shot with a bullet, you know, kind of anywhere, it's like, you know, that hurts. So there should always be an element of danger if you're in some sort of firefight or mm -hmm. if people are using these insane mutant powers against you. It shouldn't be like, okay, you get hit in the face with a giant fireball, uh, take like, you know, whatever, 30 damage, and you've got 110 health. You're like, no problem, I'm fine. I feel like it should just be a little bit more risky at, at all points in time yeah um to the to that end have have you ha, was there ever consideration for some for um some sort of massive damage rules so that 
so that um, individuals with high amounts of HP aren't completely safe? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And I'm still probably bouncing a little bit of that as I go into the finishing the editing process. Um, I'm just trying to you know, sort of cut down on the edges. Like, the, are, is the lowest health too low and is the highest health too high, right? Because you can stack health in this game. If you choose, you can take talents that give you more health. You can pick a class that gives you more health. And then you can stack defense. And all of a sudden, you're like, you know, compared to your party members, your other, you know, you're, you, you can seem unkillable. Um, so I don't, I don't mind that as a thing because if you build your guy that way, it should kind of feel that way. Because if it doesn't feel that way, then it's like, well, what did I spend all this time making my guy into this, you know, this juggernaut of sorts, right? Why did I do it if all of a sudden I'm going to just be destroyed by whatever? Now, if you get hit with a mutant attack or something, that you know, a lot of that you can't mitigate. So, you know, you're, you're going to expect that, and then you're not going to be disappointed when all of a sudden you die. Right, you're gonna be like, well, that's something I knew could happen. So <laughs> at least they're aware of it, you know. Yeah. Although at, at the same time, I um, I have I. I doubt I doubt you're gonna I doubt you're gonna pull a tomb of horrors and lol surprise you die, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> right. And as an aside, tomb. No, of that's not really overrated. the good GMing. <laughs> um. Right. <laughs> but even but um. Even with now, when it comes to testing, given how given how you need to get nothing but box cars for um, critical hits, um, was that a, was something like that done to make it so that when you actually do get one, it 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 has some it has some degree of it has some degree of weight and have critical hits been um, frequent or or infrequent when it when it comes to uh, play testing so far. Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, the way that this game works in going with the lethality of everything, if you're a character especially making only single attacks and specking into the ability to have lots of bonus attack dice, you're going to get critical hits like like a lot. Like that's the idea. If I'm shooting you with a gun and you know, it's very likely going to do quite a bit of damage. Or if I'm hitting you with a mutant attack, it's very likely going to do as much as it can do, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the if you're not one of those characters, then your critical hits are going to be, you know, pretty well i mean i guess you could say if you're only making a single attack and don't have any bonus attack dice it's only one in six but everybody else that's really going going for it they're disappointed when they don't get criticals i'll say that right um so it's it's a thing that i'm i don't know the number maybe let's call it 60 65 percent of the time depending on how you've built your your character um which i guess at first might sound like well then it's going to be just criticals all the time and like what's the fun but um you it, I just think it drives home that whole lethality of the situation, right? You're, I'm going to take a shot and it's going to hit somebody. That should be very impactful. I don't want to like whittle down an enemy. It's like, well, we're going to win this battle, this battle of attrition, round after round after round, where it's just like, please, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, there should be a lot more fireworks. I'll tell you about one talent that we have in the game that's probably one of my most, most fun things. It's called Amplify Power. It's very table gamey. You roll a D4. And you just take that roll and you minus it by one, but then you multiply the whole thing by three. So if you roll a one, that's a zero. Your attack basically fails and you do nothing, right? So that's like, oh crap, you know? And it's very like, you know, everybody like throws up their hands. But if you roll a, a, even a two or a three, like you're like, yes, like I, I, I did it. And then even if you roll a four, you're doing triple the damage on your attack, which could already be a pretty massive attack. Um, for like, you know, it's a mutant power and bloody power only. You can't, humans can't use it. Mm -hmm. um, but so that kind of thing, we've had a lot of like, you roll the dice and everybody cheers or you roll the dice and everybody's like, not again. Why would you roll it? Like you knew you were going to miss, you know? So I love that drama and I don't care that all of a sudden your guy did like 90 damage and maybe like, you know, one shot of the guy that I hope, <laughs> hope would take like a couple of rounds. Like that, that's in part of the design as well. If I don't want that guy to die, I should probably like do something else about it. Um, so, I, but I just... I want it to seem like in any given shot, anything can happen coming from the enemies or coming from you. It's all possible. Mm -hmm. Now, when it now when it comes to um, one one thing that I noticed in the in the early part of the uh, document was that whole that whole segment on what no what no 
no grid, which um for a, for a game that is that does have a little bit of um AD and D's DNA in it, I find I find that kind of yeah. amusing because a lot of for a lot of people when somebody's breaking out um this partic this particular style of play, there's the assumption that there is going to be some sort of um grid on the table. But mm -hmm. would you say that more of your games um, lean towards theater of the mind, or would you say that more of them lean towards um, the old grid and grind? Uh, absolutely theater of the mind, right? Like, we if you want to play the game with a grid, you absolutely can. Oftentimes we'll use, like, a piece of, a, a map of some sort of for playing via Zoom or something. We'll draw a map and say, you're here, you're here. So there's an approximate, like... Um, location where everybody okay i know i'm here that's approximately 40 yards away from there getting really grindy with the details of that just doesn't, didn't seem fun but if that's the type of games you want to play you can you can use it there's you know there's there's all the rules in there for grid play if you want them to be there mm -hmm. but um i found that two things one when we used a grid i wasn't visualizing the battle in my head and it what didn't seem as exciting um as soon as you take the grid away, it's all imagination. And then I'm, all of a sudden, I'm like, well, what can my guy do? I'm going to flip over this. When I'm jump off this roof, but I'm going to do like a flip, land on this guy, right? Like I wouldn't – I mean, maybe I could say that if there were a grid. But I just found it it released my mind from this two-dimensional space into a, um, imagining a three-dimensional environment. Um, and that, I, I don't know. that That is probably the biggest thing that I'm trying to reconcile where, like you said, with games like this, you're – it's – you would expect to be it to be more grid play. Um, so if, I, I don't know, like if you're not used to doing this kind of play with a very narrative heavy style, then I suppose that could be an adjustment. But I think there's a, RPGs now, it seemed to be, the narrative thing seems to be what's in, right? So I don't think that it would be a very big jump to um, take this style of play and then especially since i feel like people are used to a more narrative style now to adapt it if you will to that rather than um just saying well how do we do how do we do combat if there's no if it's 20 yards am i 21 yards away i'm going to go to 21 yards away and make an attack right it's like well that's kind of like exploiting the system a little bit and really missing the point entirely don't you think mm -hmm. but spe speaking of adjustments um the other th the other thing that I could see I could, that um I found interesting, even though I'm pretty sure some grogs might um, ar might argue is co is contradictory, is sh shooting for a more cinematic approach with a post apocalyptic game because a lot of times with um games that might be considered post apocalyptic, there's an effort made to disempower. Um, pl players and the and the narrative within, like, ha have, whereas I would, I don't think it would be out of the ordinary for somebody to pull some Errol Flynn stuff in the, in this kind of game. Yeah, I mean that's that's an interesting point. I I never really quite thought of it like that. Um, you're because you're right. Like, there's a depressingness to the whole post-apocalyptic thing, and and there's not a lot of like grandiose whatever, but. It was very, for some reason, it was very natural for me, I guess with the storyline, to say, well, this is how it went down, and now there's all these sort of um, larger-than-life characters running around. So, you know, th the battles, the, the encounters that they're going to get in are going to also be these larger-than-life encounters. You know, like, I, it, it was it was natural for me to go in that direction. Um, yeah, maybe it's not common, but, but I guess that's a good thing, right? Yeah. A bit of a breath of fresh air. I, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, now from my perspective, I do have, I do have to wonder if um, if going if going with that not that not that something like Fallout does a cinematic approach, but you can de it can definitely be said that it's it doesn't that unlike other post apocalyptic games, it doesn't take itself as seriously. Like there's always been an element sure. of oh, black yeah. humor within it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think we're um, – and I try to include some humor in my uh, – a bit of the writing, some of the powers and some of the – just the phrasing I use. And, and I, I like they're not, – not that it's supposed to be humorous or poking fun. Um, it's not tongue-in-cheek by any means. But like I think that – I 
it's also at its heart, it's a game, right? I don't want it to be too serious. You can get very serious about these things, but you've got to be having fun. And um, yeah, I don't know. Like the, it, I never really thought about the whole genre as being like you're saying, um, because it just, it, for some reason with the storyline, it didn't occur to me that that would be a difference between this game and other games. Yeah. Now, um, when it comes now, of course, when it comes to um, when it come, one of the things that was here that I was curious about is, and th maybe this is another instance where there are some notes taken from uh, Fallout is, of all things to use as a currency, you use um bullets. Yeah. I suppose it, I suppose it's not too I suppose it's not too far removed from using bottle caps in in um fall in fall <laughs> I in guess so. currency, but um was it just was it just the there's two things that come to mind one is is a certain is a certain Chris Rock sketch on the on the matter and two <laughs> is the two is the question of what was the reason for bullet specifically. That's a good question. Um, originally, there was no currency at all. It was supposed to be just a plain and simple barter system. Mm -hmm. So, like, it would be between you and your GM. You would go to some junk dealer. I got this crap. What do you? What can you give me for it? Right. But I think there is a bit of fun that you take away from the players in their um, in like loot gathering, if you will, where like I got this stuff. Ooh, this. I wonder what we can get for it. If they've got at least like a decent amount of tables where they can be like, okay, here's some equipment that I could get, or here's some weapons and bullet more up ammo I can upgrade to. If that th there is that there, that's a fun part of the game that I didn't want to lose. So it will still feel like a barter system where it's like, there's no money, but he's, but everything is expressed in the value of a light pistol bullet. So like, for example, a, um, I don't know, a, an assault rifle round one might be like, you know, worth eight light pistol bullets or something like that. So I can trade in one assault rifle round and get eight light pistol bullets, but vice versa, right? If I have all these light pistol bullets, I can get a few assault rifle rounds because they're far more rare and they're far more dangerous. Um, so that whole like go to the store and buy your stuff element can absolutely be there. Now, if you're running a campaign where it's like, there are no junk dealers, it's a desolate environment, you know, you got to live with what you got until you get to some settlement or something that's cool too. And that gives you an element of doom sort of like hanging over your head until you can actually get to these places. And then you're grateful and you're like, oh, sweet, we can finally buy stuff. Yep. So I don't want to lose the element of purchasing in the game. Now, I know, I know you mentioned that you're, that you're uh, de-emphasizing um, grid-based combat, but what I'm curious about is in playtesting, had you ever, had, had you ever tried, um, running the game as a hex crawl. Yeah. So I did some like personal tests as with doing that. Um, the only like theoretical issue is because of the large ranges of some of the weaponry and, and powers, the, your board would actually have to be pretty large. I mean, like, I guess you could say, well, each hex is worth more space, but the problem is then, everything's going to be much smaller on the board, right? And you can fit multiple characters within one hex, whereas I guess that's not common otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're deciding to make a sprawling um, encounter where you have like so-and-so like 600 meters away over here, you know, that board might be a little bit too... Um, you, you're going to have to just do some adaptation. Um, and that if that's, that's fine if you want to do that, but it, it's not going to be able to just like drop it into Pathfinder stuff that you already have and then you're good to go it it, it could be that but if you're if, it might not be it's just something to note with large ranges large weapons or, yeah yeah um now specifically when i'm talking when i mean when i mean when i thought with hex crawls are the ones where you have the hex based um sandbox map that it's assumed that the whole party is moving between hex and hex and um dealing with whatever oh. the gm puts out on the t puts out on his Random char random charts every time they move a hex. Oh, I see. Oh, that's sorry. I didn't know what you meant. Um, no, I've never tried that. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> like that's some that's something that was that was something that's been a hallmark of old school play for as long as I've um, been aware of it. And 
I w and I was just curious if that particular place, if that particular um, adventure style had ever been um, tested when it comes when it comes to this style of game, given its uh, DNA. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so you're if if all pl all players are always occupying that that single hex, is that what you're saying? Yeah, the part the idea the idea with a hex crawl is you ha is you have this large map that's full of that's full of um, hexagons that represent different kinds of terrain. Um, mm -hmm. it, they move the par the party is on one is on one hex the whole time. They move they are going to be moving between hexes and it might moving between them might take a certain amount of time. It might take a day. It might take a few hours. It depends on the GM. And the GM will probably have some encounter tables um, behind his screen every time they move a hex to see whether or not some kind of event happens, whether or not they fi encounter some NPC, or whether or not they get attacked. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that could absolutely work, especially if you're talking about, like, you know, a post-apocalyptic hellscape where you don't know what lies around the corner, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going between, you know, let's say two cities and you're, you have to get to this other city with well, all the crap that lies in between, they're all your hexes, right? And then you can basically just design these. Then, then once you get in the midst theater of the mind, right, you're in this hex now and then there's still no grid. You're just, like, in this next area and then you just play it out like a, a movie. That could absolutely work. Yeah, and... The other thing, the the other instance that I was um I was curious about I was curious about when it came to when it came to it is the is the notion of um talents because yeah what were t was the introduction of talents was that was that a means to make it so that character customization didn't depend on what they were getting out of their classes. That there was still a way to cut. There was well, still exactly. Way to personalize. Yeah, for sure. It was basically just adding another level. There are forty-seven um, talents in the game, mm -hmm. and it was another level of customization. Where if you basically say, "Okay, here are your multi-classing options," but then also you add these talents on top of it, all of a sudden the customizability goes through the roof. And because any nearly every player can take every talent, because there are a few talents that are limited to mutant and Bilotti, mm -hmm. Um but because nearly every player can take every talent, you can say, I really just want to be this kind of character and really go down like one one specific path. And some of them are sort of combat based, but some of them are like, you know, a talent called Diplomat or, you know, a talent called Pack Mule where you could like carry more crap or uh, there's just there's basically it runs the gambit. You can if you're into like making your guy really min maxi and crazy, you're probably going to take more of the the combat ones like Amplify Power or you know, one that improves your damage when you punch someone in the face or whatever. But, uh, yeah, but if you don't want to play like that, you don't have to. You can customize it however you like. Mm -hmm. Um, now, when it, now, um, when it comes to, now, when it comes to powers, um, when we were talking about that earlier, you mentioned the wizard comparison, although, um, although, for, much to my thankfulness, there is no instance of the Vancian model when it comes when it comes to po when it comes to powers or um, disciplines. <laughs> and I was and what I was curious about is um what in some of the early in some of the early drafts was there was there an attempt to try and use try and use that and what and um in the same in the same vein what sort what sort of what sort of controls could someone expect when it comes to when it comes to power use instead yeah that that was a a big thing for me i don't i always hated the idea of like you know memorizing this preparing this right that that's what you're talking about right with mm -hmm. the vantine model yeah. yeah 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 like i i i never it was always a frust it, that would ruin games for me and every time i would like build a character it would be a, designed around not having to do that right so like well i'll play a priest instead of a wizard because i don't want to like like memorize stuff at least at least a priest has a little bit more freedom or or even like a sorcerer where you just have like some mana points but you don't have to worry about memorizing spells i just hated it because it felt like all the cool stuff that i could do is being taken away from me by a mechanic and the mechanics are there as a necessary evil right the only reason why we roll dice is because 
there's a chance that something is going to go well and something's not going to go well. We've got no way to like, you know, arbitrage that other than like rolling an odds based system based on our abilities. If I could ideally remove the interface entirely and do the whole entire experience on a holodeck, then obviously that would be what I would do. So, but uh, we don't have that technology yet. Right. So, um, like I, I just wanted, uh, if your, the, your character plays the way that you expect them to play all the time. And if you, if you take these skills, you'll, you know, if you, you have a power that can only be used once and then you have to rest before you can use it again. Okay, fine. But that's something that you've like bought into and you like, you can still get to use that power. You've, it's available to you. It's not like, oh crap, if I only memorize, you know, destroy water, I could just destroy this ele water elemental and like with one spell, but instead we have to like do other stuff with them. But that would, it just, the idea that you could have done something cool, but then can't because you didn't memorize the right spell to me is like devastating to a, a character. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, um, now I should note the reason why it's called Vancey, the, um, Vancean model is because of, well, Jack Vance, since that's where, that's where that whole mm -hmm. process comes from. And, um, the and it got and well rinse wind in the um in the disc world novels is one giant parody of it <laughs> um right and the other the but the other thing that's um is always is always contentious when it comes to that model which um is more which seems to be more or less gone in in this case is the idea of um spells per day um you know, we ha we're a given. We're back in those days. A given wiz a say a wizard would have this number of spell. This number of sp it would say X number of spells at le X number of level one spells, Y number of level two spells, and so and so on. Right. Um, yeah. But with the with the uh, powers, it's just a case of you can you can you can do it. You're still gonna you're you're probably still gonna have to um roll for roll for it, but it's but that but that's where the limitation ends cuz i think i think doing i think doing the kind of amount of t amount of times per day is um doubling down on limitation right exactly oh. yeah there's there's not a lot in there like yeah there, there's there's like i said there's the recovery power where it's like this power this one specific power is powerful mm -hmm. enough that you can only use it once per day um but like that they're you know they're like they're bottom tier talents they're like they're, they're they're high level stuff and usually when you use it you don't need to use anything else because you're you're crushing it with that anyway um and also it feels very satisfying when you decide to use that recovery power it's like oh man that, that was a big it was a big thing right but yeah I, I just the idea of like i use the reference to humans resource management as being like spell slots like you're talking about but and with their ammo and that's about as close as it gets where it's like i have x amount of resources and I need to at least save them a little bit because I don't know when I'm going to have them again. But that that's really not the same thing. It's just like a, a relatively decent power parallel for resource management is the best it comes to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when it, now, obviously with, obviously with stuff like this, there's, go, there's going to be... Um, there's going there's going to be players who are going to who are going to want to um, expand and and do and do their own things within the um within the rule set because lord lord knows we all ha we all house rule our own games. <laughs> um oh, of course, I expect that, yeah. So with that with that kind of thing in mind, it I think it would be inevitable that somebody would try and create new tr new uh, trees, especially for um especially for power and discipline types. Um, mm -hmm. what I'm curious, what I'm curious about in that regard is thematically speaking, where would, where would you say the, um, dividing line is between powers and disciplines? Like if somebody was, if somebody, oh, was, interesting. Going to, if somebody yeah. was going to add a, um, a new, a new tree and, um, and what, what would be some of the what would be some of the tells that would lean it more towards a discipline, and what would be some of the tells that would lean it more towards a power? Yeah, that that's an interesting question. So, um, so the disciplines versus mutations, right? Mm -hmm. The 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 disciplines were sort of designed to be um, in, in Baladi culture in the game. At a young age, you were um, essentially designated to a discipline, like you were tested and 
um, you were it was determined that you had a predilection for this type of thing, and they had one of four. It was life force, anguish, resolve, and control, mm -hmm. right? So it was it was very sort of very very macro, right? Like not not specific. It was just kind of these general um, general categories that seemed pretty broad. Whereas mutations, I think, are a little bit more specific. Um, like there's no pure healer in the mutant. Uh, within mut mutations, there are absolutely people healing powers, but the life force Bilotti is the pure healer in the game. And if you want to do that, you're going to be by far the best at it and have the most utility in that regard. Um, and the Bilotti control character has like, I think like one offensive ability to speak of, maybe two, but that even that second offensive ability, um, I think it's called singularity where you like create a gravitational force and you can do damage to people in a group, but really you're also controlling their location. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's designed around movement of stuff and um, circumventing uh, obstacles rather than like facing it head on, which would be like more of a resolve Bilotti with brute force or an anguish Bilotti with a little bit more, um, I don't know, uh, I guess you could call it a magical approach, but not so much magical as like, um, just energy, energy and uh, like devastating forces, you know? So mutants would be like, if, if you wanted to make a mutant class or a mutant mutation, it could be something very specific, I guess. Um, and then just, you can exploit that however you like, just keep on figuring out different ways that you could act in this manner, but it would feel very um, like, okay, like take like professor Xavier, right? Mm -hmm. His, he has a very specific thing. If you punch him in the face, he's not going to have really good, great defense up, even though he's one of the most powerful mutants around. Right. So, um, it, it, that kind of thing would be more of a mutant power, whereas the Bilotti would probably be more broad, but honestly, I guess you could get a little bit more specific with them too. Um, but I think it fits thematically, like you were saying with the mutants being specific and the Bilotti being more broad generalizations of, abilities yeah especially especially since the way you describe it um the bilati sound lead a little the bilati's um training leads a little bit more into casts y yeah um and of course the of course the other thing is have is having some having some ha having some pr having some um Having some benefits when it comes to when it came when I think the I think the other thing that sh that of course should be noted is within that um the prime the primary power the primary uh, power type for Bilotti, even before you start picking powers already confers a few benefits. Yeah, I, I you dropped out for one second. Can yeah. you say that last those last um, two sentences again? That e that um, when it when it comes to that the um when it comes to that bro when it comes to that um, um broadness there's the fact that, there's of course the fact that you writ you wrote it in that Bilotti's um before they even start before before they start end up picking powers for their particular discipline there's already a few benefits that they have. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, so there's a, a there's a feel to them before you even get into what it is, which informs your decision making and in, mm -hmm. in picking them prior to it. But um, it definitely is a, um, yeah, that that's a good good note, man. That's a definitely a a thing about them that feels more um, like where where everybody has slightly more, let's call it um, customizability. A life force Bilotti will feel more like a life force Bilotti um, because of those those prior traits that they get, right? Whereas you can get a little bit more customizability with the other classes be because everything you're picking is um, your choice. Mm -hmm. That's a good uh, a good note, man. Good questions. Yeah, it's it's one of it's like whenever whenever I look whenever I look at a at a given game, I'm th I'm thinking of just. Not just what, not just what's in the book, but um, but um, long range game, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, because Lord Lord knows Lord knows I there is already a, there's already a few power sets that I could that I could that I could conceive somebody trying to make. 
if I if I didn't make oh, if sure. I didn't make them myself. And it's always it's always good to have the, to have those to have those sort of things because no matter no matter what some somebody's gonna ha- somebody's gonna hack it. Um, I think it I think when it comes to tabletop design, that's always gonna be one of its strengths that you're not lim- you're not limited to just what's in the book. For sure. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, think I've created the so-called, you know, perfect game where you're not going to find any, (laughs) A, any, like, things that you can exploit, and B, rules that you're like, ah, I don't like this. I'd rather just, let's play it like this instead. Like, there's no, um, you know, hubris for me. Like, also, I'm a team of, like, myself, and, like, you know, I have a co-author, but it's really just me doing all this stuff. So how am I, as an individual, going to, you know, do what teams and teams of people take years and years to do on a huge, uh, a huge you know, RPG project, right? Like, so I'm very proud of what I've created, but I absolutely want people to change it, make it their own. I mean, what if they think something is broken, fix it, you know? I, I hope to not have things that are like legitimately broken right in the end, but um, obviously everybody's own play styles and everybody's own GMing styles, it has to inform your decision-making. And, you know, there's... There's nothing wrong with that, you know. I love it. Yep. Now, you've um. Now the kick. Now the uh, Kickstarter has about a um about a week to go. Um, mm-hmm. what would you say have been some of the takeaways that you've learned from uh, launching this from launching the Kickstarter? Because if memories, because um, you've now you've um, this is obviously this isn't your first rodeo with Kickstarter, but. What would be some of the learning experiences you've you say you've taken from this particular one? Um, it's a great question. I think so. I was launching this at the same time as a friend of mine was also launching his game on Kickstarter, and um, he did a lot of pre work. Um, it's called Deck of Wonders. It's it's on there right now. He, he did a fantastic job. He did a lot of pre work for. Um, I, I mean, I don't months. I, I'm assuming at least six months. So he had a lot of followers going into the the Kickstarter, and I think that really helped. Where you know he was making this his primary job, and um, basically getting the word out a long time before his Kickstarter happened. Mm-hmm. And I think having that groundswell beforehand, if anybody is going to launch a Kickstarter, do the pre work. I mean, I knew I knew what I was getting to. I knew it wasn't like this wasn't going to be the thing that's going to make me quit my all my other jobs and 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 do this forever. I'm doing this as a labor of love. But um, the groundwork that you lay before a Kickstarter is so important. People need to know that you're coming. You need people need to be a little bit excited for it. People need to be reviewing it, play testing it. You got to get it in the hands and on in front of the eyes of a lot of different people. And then as soon as you launch, you get an idea for about what you can earn. You know, if you've got a thousand followers going in you can expect more than like a hundred followers coming out probably. Right. Like, so I, I think that that's, um, it's very, it's just really smart to know exactly what you're getting into and not just expect to put something up on Kickstarter and say, well, if it's a really great project, it's going to do well. Getting it in front of people is still, you know, a lot of work that you've got to do on your own. And, um, it's not the most fun part of the job. I know mean, probably all of us designers marketing and advertising, that's not why we're doing this. Like we don't love that part of the game, but um, understanding at least an aspect of that is really, really important. I think. Which I, is definitely some is definitely something I can uh, I can see. Um, now, uh, now um, you now you were you initially had were shooting for a modest five hundred, and you're at um, seventeen hundred currently. Um, at least at the mm-hmm. time of this recording. Um, now, once the extra paperwork that happens at the end of every Kickstarter finishes shaking out, um, what what time frame do you see as far as a um, release? Are you th- are you sh- are you shooting for um, early twenty twenty one or a little bit earlier than that? Um, I've got a pretty optimistic time frame on the Kickstarter. I've said December of twenty twenty, so. Um, I think that at very least, um, I'm the PDF should be available um, by December of 2020. I mean, it's it, it's all 
written. I'm just going through the process of editing at this point, and I'm trying to remove some of extraneous text that I don't need and just making everything as clear and concise as possible and going through the obvious editing process beginning to end. Um, that and all the remaining of the internal artwork, which I only have a few more pictures that it should be done by mid-October, I'm hoping at the absolute latest. And then I just have the, the last, you know, dotting my I's and crossing my T's to get um, all the final aspects of it done. And I'm pretty sure the, the PDF should be available by December. I'm hoping the book will as well. Um, the only concern I have with the book is I'll need to have proofs sent to me. I need to like, you know, send it all the, all the art and specs and they have to send it back to me and I have to approve it. And if it's wrong, I'm going to have to send it back and all that. So the book could potentially be delayed because of that, but I can't, I don't anticipate this process being um, super long because I'm not going through manufacturing myself. It's going to be print on demand through drive through RPG. All the PDFs are just downloadable instantly through drive through RPG. And, um, you know, it, it's a very simple process com contrasting with my last Kickstarter where I like made 2,500 games and had them shipped from China. And it was like, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles getting them here. And it was like, you know, very stressful getting it in before the, the holiday season. So this is a, a walk in the park comparatively. Um, and the, it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things where I think exper it, it comes down to experience being a better teacher. Cause well, given, given the difficulties of that previous one, you, you ultimately learned what not to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how, how it, um, shakes out when the time, when the time comes. With that, with that in mind, um, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show um, and brave the insanity that is uh, that is that is commonly referred to as time zones. <laughs> right. Um, thank you, man. I really appreciate you having me. Uh, really fantastic questions. Very informed about the game, and uh, I'm really, I'm really glad I did this. Yep. Yeah. And. Um, Anytime you see fit to return, the door is all, the door is always open. Um, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. Sure, absolutely. But it is encouraged. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more Good. where that came from. Lose you again. As there always is here on the open bar of the internet. And Discord decided to derp on me again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, okay. <laughs> yeah. But until then, on behalf of the good good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Oops. Awesome. <laughs>